Hello, brothers and sisters of Christ. Welcome to another Bible manhunt. A successful failure. I'm going to go ahead and reread the poem again, and then we're going to go through the scriptures, each line, and see if the scriptures say that. We're going to be like the Bereans, to check the scriptures night and day to see if those things are so. And remember, this is a whole exercise to get the brethren to get back in the Bible and start defending the Word of God. And the Bible being your final authority in all matters of faith and practice. And get away from, oh, he said, and I respect him, respect our persons, therefore it's got to be true. Uh, what say the scriptures? So we're going to read these and go through this book eventually, if we get to, before the catching away of the body of Christ. We're getting close. So we're going to read these and we're going to go through them together. So I left this poem to you for after the last manhunt, Bible manhunt. So here it is. My, my name let fame to a city small. My strategy captured a fortress tall. You'll find I'm a patriarch, author and, author and seer, and at playing or fighting I've never appear. My weapon, the greatest in Israel's band, was not made for me, it was mine second hand. I'm going to stop there, because this will be this part. And then I'll reread the other ones when we get to the other parts. But when you read down through all of this, what are we talking about here? Well, the answer, some of you already had the answer from last, last week's Bible Manhunt. You had the answer. It's talking about King David. It's talking about David. So we're going to go through the, just that first part that I read. And then the next section will be part two. And then the next section will be part three. And the next last section will be part four. It's just I started going through this and there's just so much to go through. I didn't want to make this like a five-hour video because this study is going to be about an hour. So each part is going to be an hour. And it's a good thing to go through the scriptures. How many of you love the Word of God? The King James Bible. The Word of God. If I can be like this. The Word of God. Okay. How many of you love living the Word of God? Now remember as we're going through this that things that are written before time are written for our learning. You can learn from the Old Testament. Instruction and righteousness. So let's get to the a successful failure. Part 1. Okay. So the first line that we're going to be going through, make sure you have your King James Bibles out. You can pause the video and turn to the scriptures as we go through them. So the first set of scriptures we're going to go through is 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1. If you want to start turning there. But the first line says, My name left a, let fame to a city small. So what city is that talking about? And is that scriptural? First okay. Samuel chapter 16, verse 1. Let's get into context of what's going of the city. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? This is after you know Saul screws up too much, and God says, You know what? I'm going to take my spirit from Saul, and I'm going to rent the kingdom from him, and I'm going to give it to somebody else. It says, Fill thine horn with oil and go, and I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. Now stop there. Why is this so important? Jump down to verse 4. And Samuel did that which was the Lord spake and came to Bethlehem. You mean if people in Bethlehem were Bethlehemites? Bethlehemites, if I can say it right? Yeah. And the elder of the town trembled at his coming and said, Comest thou peacefully? Well, back then, when you had a prophet come to your town and everything seemed fine, there's not a war going on, because prophets would come and you would inquire prophets of to the Lord, saying, Lord, what should I do? Should I go down and fight them? How should I fight them? Okay? So when you had a prophet that just came walking into your town, and your first thought is, is did we do something wrong? Is God going to punish us? Is the wrath of God going to come down on us? Okay? So that's what's going on there. But we see there that Bethlehemite, Jesse is a Bethlehemite, which would make David a Bethlehemite. And it was Bethlehem that Samuel went to to anoint David king of Israel. Now, we're going to read about Bethlehem in Micah. Turn to Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Okay. My name let fame to a city small. It's a small city. Bethlehem is small. Okay. Michael, Micah 5, 2. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah... Yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from old, from everlasting. 
about Jesus Christ. Turn to Luke chapter 2, verse 1. Right? It's a small city. Out of the small city came, came David, King David. His name let fame to a city small. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And it's talking about the known world. The Roman Empire controlled a lot of the known world back then, including Israel. And that the known world should be taxed, too. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one unto his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, in Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. David was a Bethlehemite from Bethlehem, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. See, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. So he's a Bethlehemite from the line, line of David, King David. But he was raised elsewhere, so he could be called, like in Galilee, they just said he came from Galilee, but they went into Egypt to hide, and when they came back, if they came back to Galilee, and now he said, isn't this man a Galilean? Don't we know his mother and his father? And he said that a person that's, I'm paraphrasing, is without honor in his own city. Why was he called a Galilean? Because he was raised there. Why is he called um, a Bethlehemite? Because he was born in Bethlehem. Okay? But my name let fame to a city small, King David. He, he made a name, God called him, anointed him to be king, and he made a name for himself that reflected off that city, that fame to a city small. I know that man. That's the son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite. He was from here. You ever heard that <laughs> out there? It's like you get someone who's from a small town, they become famous, and the next thing that small town's like, I know that person, fame, fame. I know that person, they used to live here. Let fame to a city small? Yeah. So would I agree with that one? Yeah, I would. Okay. Uh, the second line, we're getting to the second one. My strategy captured a fortress tall. Still talking about the city of David. 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 4. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years in Hebron. He reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem he reigned 30 and three years over all Israel and Judah. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem under the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither, thinking David cannot come in hither. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, the same as the city of David. And David said on that day, Whosoever getteth up to the gutter and smiteth the Jebusites, and the lame and the blind that are hated of David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. Wherefore they said, The blind and the lame shall not come into the house. So David dwelt in the fort and called in the city, called it the city of David. And David built round about from Milo and inward. And David went on and grew great. And the Lord God of hosts was with him. And Hiram king of Tyre sent messengers to David, and cedar trees, and carpenters, and masons. And they built David in house. And David perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel, and that he had exalted his kingdom for his people's Israel's sake. Okay? David did take a fortress. Okay? But it says, my strategy. Uh, he, just, he just told the man, whoever takes it, you know, take it. And he took it for himself. There's not much strategy here. Okay? Where do we get the word fortress tall? I mean, not where we get the word. Where they, they're trying to, in here, where are they trying to get the idea of fortress trawl? If you turn to Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1, it talks about Judah and it talks about Jerusalem. So you have Bethlehem, the city of David, and you have Jerusalem. Okay? You have Jesus that comes out of Bethlehem. He's born in Bethlehem. Okay? And then you have Jesus that's going to rule and reign 
and Jerusalem. So, fortress tall? Eh. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1. The word of Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountains of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all the nations shall flow unto it. I'm talking about Jerusalem. Okay. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law. Bethlehem. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Someday Jesus is coming back and he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years in Jerusalem. Okay. So kind of get that, the fortress tall. I mean, he's going to be sitting on a throne and everybody's going to be looking to Jerusalem someday. To Israel someday. And he came out of uh, Judah. So there's that there. But strategy, I was like, well... I've heard better stories of strategy in the Bible. How many of us have heard better stories of strategy in the Bible? Uh, what about the walls of Jericho? And you turn back there and read the, st the story about the walls of Jericho. and It's an impregnable fortress, side of the mountain, and then it had a huge wall where there's a gap. You know, Think of a huge crevice inside the mountain, on a side, oh, not in the mountain, but side of the mountain, and they had a huge wall. Another idea is they say that it's just a wall, period, a huge wall. I'm believing more of the huge wall, but a circular wall around the city. Why? Because the Bible talks about them marching around the city. But some, oh, it's just a crevice, and there's just a, a wall, so you couldn't go in on the left or the right because it's mountains and everything. But they marched around the city, and they marched around the city seven days, and God destroyed the wall, and they all came in. Okay. There's a little strategy there, but the best story that I like about when it comes to strategy, and there's other ones, um, read about uh, Joshua. Uh, the, tower, um, the walls of Jericho is one, but he was going in and taking people, and they asked the Lord, should we do this? Uh, there was a time with King David where the Lord said, hey, go, watch, go wait in these trees. Not in the trees, but in this area. He's like, you, want, you need to attack from this area. Not from over here, but from over here. And it's like, and I hope I don't get it too wrong, but it's, um, he's like, wait for this noise to come rustling through the trees. And when you hear that noise, that's the sign that I've given them to you and they're into your hands. Take them. Okay? There's a lot of different things. But the one I like, if you turn to Judges chapter 20, verse 4. The Benjamites. Okay, they, the, uh, um, we're going to get into this, but what happened was, is you have a man with his, I want to say for right, concubine. Man and his concubine went to the Benjamite city, which we're going to talk about here, Gibeah, and they wanted to rape him. That's how sick and perverted these people, the, the Benjamites here were. Jewish tribe really bad. They wanted to rape him. And they ended up raping his concubine and killing his concubine instead. So what does this man do? This is such evil and wickedness. What do I do? And that's where we're getting into this. Judges 20 verse 4. And the Levite, the husband of the woman that was slain, answered and said, I came into Gibeah that belonged to Benjamin, and I and my concubine to lodge. And the men of Gibeah rose against me. Like I said, they wanted him. And beset the house round about upon me by night, and thought to have slain me. And my concubine have they forced that she is dead. And I took my concubine, kind of graphic, took my concubine, and cut her in pieces, and sent her throughout all the countries of the inheritance of Israel, for they have committed lewdness and folly in Israel. Verse 7, Behold, ye are the children of Israel. Give her your audience and counsel. Some of the best stories in here is they're getting the counsel. He's saying, I need your counsel. I need Something needs to be done about this. But I'm coming to you, brothers and sisters. It's like today saying, I'm coming to you, brothers and sisters of Christ. I've been wronged. What do I do? Okay. And normally a brother could say, did you go try talking to him one-on-one? -on -one? <laughs> That's the first thing. But this isn't one person. This is a group of people. 
thing. So they're going to, he's saying to, to um, give your advice to, and counsel. Then, when they, before they go to war, they ask the Lord. Okay. Judges 20, 14 through 42, you keep reading, they talk about, the, they ask the Lord, should we go down and fight these Benjamites? And, and um, I want to get the city right. I don't know why I remember. Gibeah. Should we fight these Benjamites in Gibeah? And the Lord says, go down and fight them. So they go down and fight them. And they get beaten. Because these guys are really great warriors, evidently, and great fighters. And they get beaten. And they're trying to take the city. And they get beaten back, so they come back, and then they go back to the Lord the second time and go, Lord, should we continue going back down to fight them? Should we go back and fight them? And the Lord says, go back and fight them. So they go back down there again to fight them again, and they fail to take the city, and they lose some more uh, uh, Jews. And they come back up to the Lord and said, Lord, are we supposed to just leave, or do you want us to go down and fight them again? And the third time the Lord says, go down and fight them, for I will give them into your hands. And the strategy they used the third time was this. They had people laying in wait to destroy the city. And they had a group of army go down there. And like the th first and second time, the Benjamites came out of the city to attack them. And then they feigned that they were fleeing. They pretended like they were fleeing. And the Benjamites are like, they're fleeing as they did the first and second time. You know what? This time, because of the pride and everything... We're going to go after them. So they started chasing them down. And when they chased them down, it led them away from the city. And the next thing you know, the men that were laying in wait got up and started put, uh, destroying the, the, the city. Okay? They burned the city to the ground. And then the Benjamites turn and look and go, and their hearts start failing them for fear. Their spirits crushed. Our city, what we were fighting to defend and everything, it's gone. It's being destroyed. So then they all started scattering, and then that's when those people that pretended to flee turned and started destroying them. And it was t they destroyed the Benjamite people down, I forgot, it was very few people. But you read the story there. That strategy, they were too strong where they were, we had to divide and conquer. See, that's good strategy. So... When we read there about uh, King David, yeah, he took that city. And yeah, King David did have strategies. He did go to the Lord. There's stories where he went to the Lord and said, Lord, what should I do? Should I take these people? And I could have mentioned some of those stories, but we're going to talk about them with other things. Okay? There's other parts of the, the poem, in other words, that will let us talk about some of the things he did. Some of his conquests of, the Lord, do you want me to destroy these people? Do you want me to destroy those? So there's that. Let's get to the third one. The third one says, you'll find I'm a patriarch, author, and seer. Is that true? I said the last one we just did, I would agree that he captured a, um, a fortress tall in the sense that uh, Bethlehem is very important and Jerusalem, very important. Fortress talls. And King David did capture the city of David, Bethlehem and made it an even bigger city. But number three, you'll find I'm a patriarch, author, and seer. And some of you are probably saying, well, author, yeah, and we're going to get into that, where he wrote, he wrote um, most of the Psalms. So that one's a given, that's something we kind of know. But patriarch, seer, I'll give you, I'll give you a little bit of heads up. King David is never called a seer. But is this wrong? No. You say, well, come up what? We'll get to that. But patriarch, okay, he is a patriarch, but where is he called a patriarch? Turn to Acts chapter 2, verse 29, in your King James Bibles. Okay, Here we learn that he is a patriarch. So I'm very important in the lineage and heritage of a, of a certain group of people. He's a patriarch. Acts 2, 29, men and brethren... Let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried. And his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Verse 30. Therefore, being a prophet, that's a key word, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of the loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. 
He seen this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. Side note, once again, when Jesus went down to hell, he went down to Abraham's bosom. That's where Abraham's bosom was. It was in hell. Hell was separated. There's a big cavern. Read the story that Jesus tells about Lazarus and the rich man. There's a big cavern. And on this side you have people burning that deserve to be burned and burned for all eternity. And then you have people on this side, which is the Abraham's bosom, that were waiting for salvation. The Old Testament, the Levitical laws, when it came to animal sacrifice, it covered their sins, but it didn't take their sins away. They still needed Jesus Christ. So when Jesus went down to hell, he went down to there to leave captive, captivity captive and free them. And when he raised, a lot of them got raised and got seen of many people. Okay. I just have to defend the Lord on that because people, the false teachings that Jesus burned in hell. No, he didn't. Notice it said, neither his flesh did see corruption because he didn't go to that side with all the fire and people were burning. He went to the side that had Abraham's bosom. But we read in here that David is called a patriarch. But he's also called a prophet. This is the only place I could find that he's called a prophet. Because at first when I've read that, I was like, wait a second. Yes, King David had the Holy Spirit, but he was given a special office, almost like Moses. He was given a special office when they started doing kings. Because they didn't want Jesus to be their king. We talked about this. They didn't want God who is Jesus was there, who is God. They didn't want God to be their king. They wanted a man to be their king. And I was like, this is wrong. But then I got proven wrong. Why? Because when you see something like that, you start studying the scriptures. What do the scriptures say? We see there that he's called a prophet. You say, well, what does that mean anything? Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 9. Now, you can pause the video and read 1 through 16. And you read the whole story about Saul. He's looking for his, the asses, the donkeys, that is missing. And then they go, and they, uh, oh, there's, a, there's a person here that can tell you where they are. And what do they call that person? A seer. And when you get to the verse that talks about, Before time in, in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he came, spake, Come and let us go to the seer. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. So a prophet and a seer are the same thing. Now, I understand the, the word seer gets perverted today. But back then, they were seers. And then at some point in time, they started calling them prophets. And we'll show a scripture. If you want to turn to 1 Chronicles 29, 29. And it's even in David's time. That's why they call David a prophet. It says here, Now the acts of David the king, first and last, behold, they are written in the book of Samuel, the seer. Because if you read uh, 1 Samuel chapter 9, 1 through 16, you read the whole story. He's called a seer in his time. And it says, And in the book of Nathan, the prophet. So at some point between there and Nathan. Nathan was also the prophet that we'll get ahead of the, getting ahead of myself with the poems that gets comes up and gets right in David's face when he commits adultery and murder. Okay. So it's in David's time, it's Nathan, and now Nathan's called a prophet, whereas Samuel was called a seer. Before time, what was called a seer is now called a prophet. They're one and the same. Okay? And in the book of Gad, the seer. So you still had another person who wrote that was around Saul's time that was a considered a seer. So even though it didn't call King David a seer, it called him a prophet. And a seer and a prophet are the same thing according to the scriptures. Now, so, seer and, and patriarch. We, did, we checked the scriptures, that's true. And then we're going to talk about the author. Turn to Psalms 1-1. We're going to read one of the Psalms. we got to, because we're talking about King David wrote most of the Psalms. Okay? He had such a love for the Lord, that's why he was called a man after God's own heart. Okay? His heart wanted to be after God's heart all the time. And I pray, brethren, that's us today, that our hearts want to go after the Lord. Okay? 
Thy word have I hid in my heart. I'm getting ahead of myself. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. We take God's word and we put it in our heart. And that's how we're going after the Lord today. Mm-hmm. Having a heart uh, that's after God's own heart. Psalms 1.1 Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. This right here. For today, the word of God. Excuse, excuse me. I thought I was going to sneeze there for a second. Okay. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. Today, we're under the law of God. This is Romans 8. You, don't have to, you can t- take some time to go read Romans 8. It talks about when we're lost, we're under the law of sin and death. We're carnally minded and we're walking after the flesh. When we get saved, we're now under the law of God. We've been freed from the law of sin and death, liberty, and now we're under the law of God. And we are spiritually minded, walking after the Spirit. Jesus said He'll send the Comforter to you. He'll open the words of God to us. The Holy Spirit opens the Scriptures to us. This is your foundation in all matters of faith and practice. Do you delight in the laws of of, of the Lord, that spiritual fellowship with the Lord, through His written word, through prayer, through fellowship with the brethren, something to think about. And in His law doth He meditate day and night. Are you reading this book every morning? Are you starting your day with the Word of God? Or are you ending your day with the Word of God? Are you meditating on it? Are you applying it to your life? Right? Three, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters that bringeth fruit in, forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Brothers and sisters Christ, the changed life. The changed life. There's the fruit. And you're going to prosper as a Christian as long as this is your final authority and your foundation in all matters of faith and practice. And I can tell you from experience, anytime my Christian walk started failing and it wasn't prospering, it was failing, is because I steered away from this and started going with man's traditions, started giving into the flesh and started getting into sin and temptations. Bottom line, you start following away from this and you start steering away from this and you start going to the world. That's when you're not going to prosper as a Christian. You're going to start failing the Lord as a Christian. Right. And there's fruit. Evidence of salvation. Fruit. The changed life. You shall know them by their fruits. Right. Uh, uh, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Like the chaff. And every time I read this, it makes me think of the uh, either lukewarm Christians, which are mostly false, but the fake Christians that they shop around. Well, I like this person for a while until he says something. Oh, I don't like that shirt that person's wearing. So I'm going to go over here to this Babel building. Or I'm going to go to that Babel building. This Babel building splits up and they're going to go this way, this way. And everybody's just being tossed to and fro. The, the New Testament talks about being tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. You think you can pick and choose what you want to believe and you don't have a final authority. And I'm talking about my lost life as a professing Christian in the Babel building system. They didn't have a final authority. They were their final authority. And they were tossed around. People would come and go. Verse 5. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment. And I look at that and I think, judgment seat of Christ. And he's right. The judgment seat of Christ is reserved for saved sinners. When we have the North sinners in the congregation of the righteous... When the cashing away of the body of Christ finally happens and we get there and we're all standing there, we're going to see who was truly saved and who made it there. Yeah, not made it like they've earned it. I'm talking about who's there, who was truly saved, versus those who are fake and false. Because the ungodly, the fakes and the false, that aren't covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, aren't going to be there. Verse 6, For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. 
Remember what we talked about. God knows the heart. He knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. All sin is negative. The ways of the world lead to destruction. If you choose the way of the world, you're going to hell and then to the lake of fire to burn for all of eternity. God knows this. He looks at the heart. He looks at your heart, brothers and sisters. He looks at mine. I could totally screw up. And we're going to get, I'm getting ahead of myself. King David, you can totally screw up as a Christian. But God looks at your heart. Right? You can make a mess and totally screw up, fall on your knees in repentance, and God will forgive you. God will get you back up on your feet. He'll put you back together and say, okay, get back to where I told you. Remember Jonah? <laughs> Jonah, Jonah, the book of Jonah. Well spits him back out on the road. Okay, now get back to what I told you to do. Get back to doing the work of the Lord. Yeah. Okay. Romans 7.22. If you want to turn to Romans 7.22. Well, that's just mainly Old Testament, and you're kind of referring to the New Testament. Romans chapter 7, verse 22. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Remember the law of God, that spiritual kingdom, that spiritual fellowship. God's going to open his word to you, give you the commands. He's going to change your life. The do's, the don'ts, the what you're supposed to believe in, the major doctrines, the precious promises, that blessed hope. Okay. I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It can only happen through Jesus Christ. True biblical salvation. Repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, finished work, His finished work on the cross. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. And when He saves you, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I may serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Brothers and sisters, Christ, you're always going to be struggling with the flesh. Always going to be struggling with the flesh. God knows this. Paul knew this. That's why he tells us, but what does God do? Does he just leave us, oh, you're going to, that flesh is just too much for you, and I'm just going to stand back and do nothing. Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 13, you don't have to turn here, but it says, There hath no temptation taken you, but it's such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. But will, with the temptation, provide a way for you to escape. A way, make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Excuse me. He'll provide a way. Why? How does he provide that way? Remember what we read there. What Paul's talking about, that with my mind I might be able to serve the law of God, but with this body of flesh, the law of, of sin. Right here. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Guess who wrote that? Some people say, well, Solomon wrote that. But it's still in Psalms. Psalms 119.11. Okay. Psalms 119.9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Brother, sister in Christ, it comes down to this. You love this and you elevate this in your life on how you live it and you put down the flesh because you hate this wicked flesh. How many of us are getting tired of this wicked flesh? This needs to be elevated. Flesh needs to be put down. What's going on lately? Uh, seeing people that are putting this down and elevating the flesh. A lot of professing Christians and some that I believe are saved. They're putting the Bible down and elevating the flesh. Okay. But I didn't mean to go off on a little tangent, but I wanted to read. You read Psalms. Who wrote most of the Psalms? King David. He was an author. Solomon wrote the, uh, uh, the, some of the Psalms too. Okay. So, is that true? You'll find I'm a patriarch. Yep, we read where, where King David was patriarch. Okay, was he an author? Yep, he wrote most of the Psalms. Was he a seer? Little, they're trying to trick you. They're trying to, you know, see if you're going to really do a thorough study. And you go, well, no, that's false because he was never called a seer. But he was called a prophet. And before time, what's called a prophet today was called a seer for time. So since he was called a prophet, can he, can he also be called a seer? Absolutely. Okay. So now four. And at playing or fighting, I've never appeared. 
This is the one where I kind of disagree a little bit. Okay, at, And at playing or fighting, I have never appeared. So let's hit the playing part. How many of you caught on to that and said, well, that must be when he was playing the musical instrument, when he was playing for Saul? Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. I put that in there because I wanted to point out that you can lose, in the Old Testament, you can lose the Holy Spirit. How do we know this? Keep reading. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah, but the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. King David's always, if you read some of the Psalms that he wrote, he's saying, Lord, take not that Holy Spirit from me. Take not thy spirit from me. Okay, in other words, you could lose it. Saul did. said right there, but the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. So what's their solution? Verse 16. Let our Lord now command thy servant, which are before thee, to seek out a man who is cunning, player, uh, player on an harp. And it shall come to pass, when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, that he shall play. With his hand, and thou shalt be well. And Saul said unto his servant, Provide me now a man that can play well, and bring him to me. Then answered one of his servants and said, Behold, I have seen that the son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite. This is where King David's called a Bethlehemite. Jesse, the, the Bethlehemite. I'm sorry. The son of Jesse. Jesse's been called a Bethlehemite. David's his son. David's a Bethlehemite. That is cunning and playing, and a mighty, valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in matters, and comely person, and the Lord is with him. Wherefore Saul sent his messengers unto Jesse, and said, Send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. And Jesse took an ass laden with bread, and a bottle of wine, and a kid, and sent them by David to his, his son unto Saul. And David came to Saul, and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor-bearer. Notice here, he loved him greatly. We're going to get to this a little bit later. This is, this is very important to remember for later. But he became his armor better. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. And it came to pass, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took a harp and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Now some people say it's the playing. Okay, they found a man that was... When they were looking for a man that could play music, play the harp, King David, he wasn't king at the time, but David was the first one that came to mind. So saying that there was nobody else, I mean, they didn't think of anybody else. Okay, At playing or fighting, I've never appeared. So at playing, he had never appeared. David was the first one that came to mind. That's all they thought of. Okay, let's get David out here. So I, I, I agree with that. Okay. But one of the things that people talk about here was that the music that, that, Kale, that, that caused the evil spirit to flee, it, fl it left him every time he started playing music, absolutely. Or was it the fact that King David had the Holy Spirit in him? See, music today can be used to trick people. You can have emotional music. That's why we tell people with hymns. You can have hymns that are part of pagan holidays, and they're just, oh, they're just so great. So, with any hymn, you need to make sure to verify it with the Word of God. Is it speaking the truth, or are they adding a lot of stuff, and then the music, because the music is so emotional and melodious, it distracts you from the actual words of the hymn. Right? Today, the world, they have a lot of what's called emotional music, and it just gets you all emotional, and you stop listening to what's actually being said, and you're just your body's just entranced with the music, and you're not even paying attention to what's being actually said. Right? So... There's that. I believe a good part of it was because he had the Holy Spirit in him. And only the Holy Spirit of God can chase off an evil spirit. Uh, turn to Samuel chapter 18, verse 5. So let's get this part about fighter. A fighter he never has a peer. So what are they trying in this book, what are they trying to compare that to? He's, he's got no peer as a fighter. Are they comparing him to all fighters? 1 Samuel 18, verse 5. And David went out with the, 
whithersoever Saul sent him, and behaved himself wisely, and Saul sent him over, set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of Saul's servant. And it came to pass as they came, when David was returned from slaughtering all the Philistines, that the women came out of the city of Israel singing and dancing to meet Saul with tabrets, with joy, with instruments of music. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. So are they comparing David as a fighter to everyone at that time? No. Who are they comparing him to? Saul. Compared to Saul, David was a greater fighter. And a greater warrior. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get to this. Now, I'm not saying, real quick, I'm not saying he wasn't the best warrior out there, period, of his time. What I'm saying is, is what they're using to try to justify it, is they're trying to say it's compared to Saul. They're using a passage that compares it to Saul. Mm -hmm. And wherever he went, he won. Well, he had men of war with him. It wasn't just him that went. And we're going to talk about some of those men that went with them. So please bear with me. This one's a little bit longer section. Okay. But you see there, Saul slayed his thousands and David his ten thousands. What happened after this? Saul heard that and said, They've attributed only thousands to me, but unto, unto David they've attributed tens of thousands. And, ba and, and Saul eyed him from that day forward, and bitterness in his heart and pride, I believe, started festering. And remember what we read earlier, he loved him. And that love quickly disappeared and turned into hate. That's what happens when you've got bitterness in your heart. That bitterness will fester and eventually it'll turn to hate. So be careful. Okay. But there we see the contradiction. But my thing is, is, what about all the other men? Does the Bible talk about other valiant men of war along the same time as King David? Turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 11, verse 10. This is going to be a long one. <laughs> 1 Chronicles chapter 11, verse 10. These also are the chief of the mighty men whom David had, who strengthened themselves with him in his kingdom, and with all Israel to make him king according to the word of the Lord concerning Israel. And this is the number of the mighty men whom David had. Jerobo, Jesobim, a Hakmonite, the chief of the captains, he lifted up his spear against 300 slain by him at one time. In one situation where they were fighting, he slayed 300 men by his own hand. Now, this isn't like today where you have a gun that does the work for you. This is where you had to have a weapon in your hand and you had to go do the work yourself. You had to fight yourself. Okay. Verse 12, And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, Ahohite, if I can say it right, who was one of the three mightiest. He was with David at Pasadena, and there the Philistines were gathered together to battle, where was a parcel of ground full of barley, and the people fled from the Philistines. They're fleeing. And they set themselves in the midst of the parcel and delivered it and slew the Philistines, and the Lord saved them by a great deliverance. Okay, you've got only a small group of men, mighty men, with King David, and they hold their ground, and they just slew all these Philistines. Here you have t probably twice the number of Jews fleeing from these Philistines. And then here you got like three to four, because it says three mightiest men, then it said this guy was here with King David, so it doesn't say how many, but King David didn't have a lot of men with him. And here come all these Philistines. They slaughtered him. And the Lord saved them by a great deliverance. Now three of the thirty captains went down to the rock to David into the cave of Adullam. And the host of the Philistines encamped in the valley of Rephraim. And David was then in the hold, and the Philistines' garrison was then at Bethlehem. They had taken over Bethlehem. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem. That is, the, that is at the gate. And the three break through the host of the Philistines. Three men. This is talking about the three mightiest men. Broke through the Philistines. 
and drew water out of the well of, the, of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it. So one person's drawing the well, two of them are defending them. And they broke through into their own area. They've got control of the city. And it's just these three men. Boom. And brought it to David. But David would not drink it, but poured it out on to the Lord and said, My God forbid it me, and I should do my God forbid it me that I should do this thing. Shall I drink the blood of these men that have put their lives in jeopardy? For with the jeopardy of their lives they brought it. Therefore he would not drink it. These things did these three mightiest. Pretty amazing. And Abishai, the brother of Joab, he was chief of the three for lifting up his spear against three hundred. He slew them and had name among the three. Of the three, he was more honorable than the two, for he was their captain. Howbeit, he attained not to the first three. Benaniah, the son of Jehoadad. Thirty-third book has a great study on this. It's called Lion Like Men. I, I suggest you watch it. I'll try to link it below. Um, but Lion Like Men, it's a great study. He talks about Benaniah, the son of Jehoadad, the son of violent man of Kib K K Kabzeel. Who had done many acts, he slew two lion like men of Moab. Also, he went down and slew a lion in the pit in a snowy day. And he slew an Egyptian, a man of great stature, five cubits high. And in the Egyptian's hand was a spear like a weaver's beam. So I'm not saying this is exactly this guy was just as big as uh, Goliath was, but it could have been close. And he went down to him with a staff. And he plucked the spear out of the Egyptian's hand. Boom. And then he slew him with his own spear. That's a warrior. These things did but Benaniah the son of Jehoadad, and had the name among the three mightiest. Behold, he was honorable among the thirty, but, a plain, but obtained not to the first three. And David set him over his guards. And you can keep reading. There's a lot of mighty men that followed King David. And there's great stories about him. So when it's talking about he's the mightiest, my thing is his chapter and verse. He was a man of war. It talks about when they were seeking out someone to play, he was a good man. And could he have been the greatest fighter out of all of them? Absolutely. But we've got to remember that there was more than just him that was fighting. Okay, that were warriors. So I just want to throw that part in there. So am I going to just flat out disagree with that? Not totally. It's just one of those things where it's like, well, there's, there's more to it. Okay. The men that were with King David helped him. Now we're getting to the last one for this part of the study. Remember, this is only part one. And like I said, it's going to get to be close to an hour long. And my feet are already hurting. <laughs> i got wood floors. Um, so that's the last part right here. Number five it says, My weapon, the greatest in Israel's band, was not made for me. It was mine second hand. How many of you could guess what this was? Brothers and sisters of Christ, how many? How many of you guessed that this was Goliath's sword? Well, if you guessed it was Goliath's sword, you would be right. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 21, verse 8. Mm -hmm. I want to get into context. Uh, this is when he actually takes the sword and uses it. And then we're going to get in context of where the sword came from. 1 Samuel 21, verse 8, And David said unto Abimelech, he's on the run from King Saul, and he comes to this um, place where Abimelech is, and he's a priest, and said unto Abimelech, Is there not here under thine hand spear or sword? For I have neither brought my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. He had to leave in haste. He didn't take it. He's run from King Saul because King Saul's trying to kill him. Verse 9, And the priest said, the sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom thou slewest in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If thou wilt take it, take it, for there is none other save that here. And this is King David's own words. And David said, There is none like that. Give it me. So when the, the poem is saying, My weapon, the greatest in Israel's band, yeah. Now, what about the part about was not made for me? It was mine second hand. Well, we read there the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. So where did he get the sword? Who is this man, Goliath? A lot of us know the story, but let's go through it real quick before we end this part of the study. 
1 Samuel chapter 17. If you want to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're going to read 23 and then we're going to jump down to 38. And he talked with them, and behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. What was the words that were spoken? He was saying, I defy the armies of the living God. And he says, bring out you a champion. If, if for by chance he beats me, we will become your servants, your slaves. And if by any chance that I beat him, then will ye be our servants. In other words, our slaves. That's what he's doing. I defy and curse the God uh, of the Jewish people. That's what he was doing. And you can read about that in that chapter. Uh, go, uh, first Samuel, for a second, I'm going to go back for a second. No, I'm sorry, I'm not. I just lost my place. Please forgive me, brothers and sisters Christ. Jump down to verse 38. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go. In other words, he's, I can't. He essayed to go. For he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off of him, and he took his staff in his hand, and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook, and only took one stone, and put them in the shepherd's bag, which he had even in a script, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man... And the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. He cursed David by his lowercase g, gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Now most people would be scared. But was David scared? No. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee. And I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Remember the stone he's going to take. Okay. What does God refer to in the Old Testament? What's one of his titles? It's capital R, rock. Sometimes it's, he's referred to, Jesus referred to as a lowercase r, rock. Okay? But Jesus, God, the Word, capital W Word, manifest Word, and then the written Word. Okay? That's the rock. Jesus talks about he's the foundation. He's the cornerstone. He's the head of the corner. He's not just the foundation, but he's the head. Remember that. And David put his hand... And it, okay, give it into your hands. Verse 48. And it came to pass when the Philistines arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hastened and ran towards the army to meet the Philistine. It's a lot of courage. Why? Because he knows God's on his side. That's why we need to have courage, brothers and Christ, because God is on our side. Okay? We always need to still say chapter and verse, but remember, God is with us. If God is with us, who can be against us? So David, let's see, 49, ran toward to meet the Philistine, 49. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sunk in his forehead. Okay, stop there for a second, I'm going to put my finger there so I can remember. That's like us with the Word of God, and please hear me out, that's us with the Word of God. Whew, we sling it, and it hits him right in the forehead. <laughs> what do they do? Okay, remember the promise that uh, Goliath made. If you beat me, we will become your servants. If I beat you, you're, you'll become your servants. How many times have you had brethren, professing brethren out there, that attack the major doctrines, that attack absolute truth, that says, if you can prove to me in the King James Bible that such and such is the truth, I'll repent. 
And how many times have we proven it's the truth? <laughs> Smack them right up the forehead with the Word of God. And what did they do? Well, what did the people do after they saw Goliath was killed? Let's keep reading. And he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with the sling and with the stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of his sheep thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. Now what did the Philistines do? And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. Kind of like when the Bible talks about a hireling. You call out the hireling and you destroy the hireling, the, the, the sheep will scatter. Yeah. I don't know how many times I've done that, Brother Christ, where I said, hey, okay, here's the truth then. Here's the truth. And what do they do? They run. Some, some of them repent and say, okay, you're right. That's what the scriptures say. I was wrong. And there's times I've had to do that where someone's corrected me through the scriptures, and I said, you know what? You're right. I'm wrong. But I'm talking about these people that are false converts. They're trying to sneak in and sow seeds of destruction and try to say, okay, well, you know, the Trinity's not that big of a deal. Yeah, it is. And I've made that challenge to them. Capital T, Trinity is a title for God. Can you show me capital T, Trinity is a title for God in the scriptures? Can you show me in the scriptures where it says God is three persons? God in three persons. It's not there. I'm always like, I'll repent. You show me that, I'll repent. The Godhead is in Scripture. That's the title God chose. Trinity is not a title for God. It's a man-made pagan gods, plural, like Goliath, cursing with gods, plural. It's not in Scripture. The true term for the Bible, the true title for God, is Godhead, capital G, Godhead. And it's God in one person, and that person is Jesus Christ. But I've even made that challenge to him. Show me in scripture. I'll repent. Um, right now there's a big fight going on about the holidays. And I'm like, okay, show me in scripture where the birth of Jesus Christ is to be celebrated. And, you know, and we're, we're allowed to worship a baby Jesus. And you're worshiping baby Jesus as a holy day. Chapter and verse. I'll repent. Show me in the scriptures or any of the early Christians, the, the apostles, Paul, Peter, any of them. Show me where they're doing that. Chapter and verse. Show me where a Christmas tree is involved in the birth of Jesus Christ at all. Chapter and verse. Christmas lights. Christmas gifts. Christmas dinner. Christmas this. Christmas that. And I say chapter and verse. I say, I'll repent. And I actually would if they could prove it to me. But most people, when you say, hey, can you show it to me? If you can't then you need to repent. And they don't. They just run off and take off. What happened to these Philistines? And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. They took off. But where did King David get that sword? From uh, Goliath. So, when it says, My weapon, the greatest in Israel's band, was not made for me, but was mine second hand, I agree with that one. We could back it up with Scripture. Okay? It wasn't made for him, it was his second hand. He, Goliath had it first, then he had it second hand. Okay? And it was the greatest in Israel's band. Okay? This is a good exercise, Brother Sister Christ, to be looking through the scriptures, and then sometimes we find more than what we're initially looking for in the scriptures. And we can talk about other things like we did the Psalms, about other things, which is great. So this is only going to be part one. Okay? So I will see you in part two. So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching.